jumping on like maybe next year, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming to our Changemaker series. It is my honor to talk with Dr. Taylor today, the President and CEO of the Institute for Women's Policy Research. And Dr. Taylor, again, it's so thrilling to have you back here at CAP and welcome home. One of the questions I really wanted to ask you as the current director of the Women's Initiative is, you've had such an incredible career and you really could have done anything you wanted to do because you've been at the forefront of ensuring equity in national health policy and by centering marginalized communities and black women. I would love to know, why did you choose to come to CAP when you could have gone anywhere? And what kind of issues did you work on when you were here from 2016 to 2019? Well, first off, I was always such a huge fan of CAP. Um, I remember working on the Hill and coming to a number of events here. Um, was always enamored by the minds um, and big ideas that I would hear when I would be in this place. And so when an opportunity came about to join the Women's Initiative team as a director of Women's Health and Rights, I jumped at the opportunity. Um, and I think, you know, when we were, when I was here, you know, I do want to take a step back and reflect on the fact that, you know, those were some difficult years. Um, you know, we really found ourselves in the throes of, of working to protect, you know, access to abortion and contraception. Um, you know, we were also working on defending the Affordable Care Act. And so at times I really felt like the work was around the clock. Um, we were also a very invested team that was so passionate about ensuring women's rights in this country. Um, and, you know, I think one of the pieces that I'm most proud of is, you know, building out a body of work around the black maternal health crisis. Um, you know, that was a new issue to cap. Um, we took a step back to think through and build a really comprehensive approach to the issue that really touched on different policy teams in the organization to show the intersectional nature of the black maternal health crisis, the impact on black women and families. And so I think that's the thing I'm most proud of, but you know, there's so much to say about this building, this place, the people yeah. um, that walk through these halls and I'm proud to have been a part of it. That's incredible. I'd love to know what your team was like when you were starting and I'm sure it changed because 2016 to 2019 was a really a time of crisis in the United States in so many ways. It was, you know, we, we there were a few changes on the team, but for the most part, you know, the, the core sort of leaders of the team were there. And um, on one hand, you know, we were busy a lot and doing a lot of work, but also we had fun together. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I do want to take a step back and say, you know, the women on our team, you know, people like Shopa Fatke, who, you know, went on to work in the Biden-Harris administration on the Gender Policy Council, Jocelyn Fry, who's now the president at the National Partnership for Women and Families, um, you know, and a host of other folks, they were, you know, essential to mentoring me and we supported each other during that time. We had a lot of fun together, but also we, you know, worked hard. And so I think a testament again to CAP as a place to help and build the next generation of leaders um, is clear in the team that I was working with because now all of us have gone on to, you know, new leadership opportunities. And we continue to navigate um, and build a future that I think is more promising for women. So I'm really proud of that team and, and really miss them. And luckily we still get to work together in other ways. I love that at the Women's Initiative, the sisterhood is always so strong. Whether it's in the past, present or future, I feel like women are always supporting women at CAP and at other places too, For which sure. is incredible. Um, one thing, you know, I've followed your career for a while. And what I've noticed is that after CAP, you've been the president and CEO of so many places at the National <laughs> WIC Association and now at the Institute for Women's Policy Research. I wanted to know from your time at CAP, is there a lesson in leadership, particularly in advocating with and behalf of marginalized communities that you have taken with you as the president and CEO of so many places? You know, I think the thing that I, um, one of the things that I value most about, you know, my time at CAP and what I learned there is really the importance of strategic partnerships. 
Um, you know, one thing about working in Washington and sort of being in this bubble and the quest to have influence, you know, with policymakers, for example, you know, we're not on an island when we do this work. There's no one organization that's that's creating all of these policy wins, right? It's really important that we work together, um, you know, to build um, really important and key policy solutions that serve, you know, those most vulnerable in this country. Um, and so when I was at CAP, I really learned the essence of what strategic partnerships look like, particularly when working with, you know, as a women's initiative, working with other women's rights organizations, but also thinking about, again, the intersectional nature of a woman's life, right? Women do not lead single issue lives. And so oftentimes those strategy conversations about the groups that may not necessarily be in the women's space um, that were important for us to work with, um, you know, also was a big part of how we strategized. And so thinking about, you know, groups working in the, the higher education field, um, the poverty team was also another team that we worked closely with when I was at CAP. And then that also helped introduce us into groups that were also working in the poverty space, getting them to think more about issues like access to abortion, maternal health, um, and how those issues are also impacting their constituencies. And so I think the, you know, thinking about strategic partnerships is something that I um, really honed being here. Um, but I think also to the communications piece, you know, um, at CAP, you know, we talked a little bit about this earlier, <laughs> you know, you're sort of thrown out there, um, you know, you kind of like sink or swim. And so being a national spokesperson on these key issues, even if you come through those doors and that may not be something that you're well versed in, all of the supports we had under this roof in order to make sure that we were finessing our talking points and that um, we performed, you know, um, to the justice of these issues in front of the camera, on podcasts, on radio, um, was also really key to my career. And so that was also a springboard for me to be able to go off and have some really amazing opportunities um, in the press, testifying before Congress. So there's an endless list, mm -hmm. I think, of the things that I was able to learn under this roof that have really been essential to my leadership journey and really thankful for that. But I also want to ask you, you know, Sabrina, how are you finding your experience, you know, as a director of the Women's Initiative? I think you're about a year or so into the role. Yeah. What has it been like for you working for CAP? I, I have to use the phrase that you just used of performing to the justice of the issues at hand and that there is no issue that is a single woman's issue and the importance of an inter intersectional approach. I came to CAP at a time where the mass chaos and confusion of the Dobbs decision was in full force. And for me, what I have really loved about my current role at CAP and hopefully in the future work that I can do is really explaining to whether it's a 16 year old on TikTok or a federal official in DC who has never heard of TikTok or doesn't use it about the intersections of what meaningful abortion access looks like and that the criminalization of pregnant women, of um, the role of the effect of extreme heat on women, there are so many ways in which we can understand the state of all women in the United States today. And it's what I've really loved is being able to thread the needle for all different kinds of audiences, whether it's in a very wonky and technical long column, which I think our poor editorial team has to suffer through <laughs> in my work, or if it is doing a video that is effective, but also accessible with our incredible video and digital teams. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love is that CAP products, CAP work is meant for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited to talk to you about your experiences in leadership at CAP, especially when it comes to Black Maternal Health Week, mm -hmm. which is really um, about centering the tragedy and crisis of Black maternal health in the United States. The United States has more pregnancy-related deaths than any other wealthy country in the world, which for me, as the child of refugees, is always astonishing that that is not what you know my parents came for. Mm -hmm. And what we know is 
always like just shocking to say out loud that black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than white women. And what I really wanted to focus on with you is you were at CAP from 2016 to 2019. What were the efforts you were focused on then and now? Mm -hmm. And if there is any change, unfortunately, or not between them? Yeah. Um, you know, it's changed, as you mentioned, because of Dobbs. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, when the Dobbs decision came down, it was, it was so tough to swallow. Um, as someone who has been working in reproductive justice for, you know, decades at this point, um, it's something that we always knew as a community could happen, um, but that doesn't mean that the blow um, yeah. was lessened by, you know, that fact. And um, you also mentioned that I work on maternal health. And so I think one of the things that I want to sort of pull out um, in terms of this conversation is the interconnectedness of lack of abortion access and the maternal health crisis, right? I think because of the Dobbs decision, we're no longer in a situation where we can talk about those issues in silos. We shouldn't mm -hmm. have been talking about them in silos even before, but now it's, it's critical for us to talk about them um, in the context of, I think, the continuum of reproductive and maternal health care that women need in this country. And based off of the fact that we know um, you know, that a national abortion ban will actually worsen an already dire maternal health mm -hmm. crisis in this country. Um, there's research that came out of the University of Colorado Boulder mm -hmm. um, that looked at what a national ban on abortion would do to impact our maternal mortality rate. And we know that for all women, it would increase our maternal mortality rate by about 20%, and for black women by almost 40%. And so we have to talk about um, I think the broader context of this issue around a lack of access to abortion care and what it's going to do to, to worsen our maternal health crisis, not to mention all of the other important, I think, intersectional pieces um, that are related to abortion access. So things like, you know, when a woman has access to abortion, she's able to be more productive in her life. Mm -hmm. She is more likely to finish her education. Um, she's more likely to have the tools and supports to parent the children she already has with dignity. We know that most women um, who have abortions are already parents. And so these are really important conversations that we need to be having. And, you know, taking a step back and, and wearing that IWPR hat, you know, we are doing research that looks at what the economic implications mm -hmm. are, you know, for um, abortion bans in this country. And it's really important that we take a step back and, and acknowledge that and have a conversation about why it's an issue. Thank you. And what I really appreciate about what you just said is the need to have an intersectional framework in so many different ways and that the conversation around abortion access as healthcare for pregnant women extends just so much further beyond the one act of being able to obtain an abortion in really dire times. And one thing that has been really important to me in post Dobbs America is trying to thread the needle on how abortion access impacts women differently, how our criminal and civil enforcement systems are used in abortion now in a very different way than ever before, mm -hmm. and really trying to explain that an intersectional approach is necessary for successful policy outcomes in this new world. And you've touched on so many different points of intersectionality already, but I'd love to know if you have a favorite one, especially <coughs> one that you're working on at IWPR mm -hmm. that is an addition and value add to this space that we're in right now. Yeah, well, obviously, you know, I think the intersections between, you know, like economic justice and access to abortion are key, and that's a central piece of what we do at IWPR. But also, I don't think we can talk enough about the racial component mm -hmm. of, you know, abortion access. Um, <clears throat> You know, in this country, you know, we have a very ugly history that is rooted in the reproductive oppression of women of color. Uh, and that has been traced and documented extensively, particularly when it comes to black women and native women. Mm -hmm. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that we continue to see um, 
racism sort of built within our institutions and structures in this country. And so to me, you know, having bans on abortion um, or even bringing back in the maternal health crisis, mm -hmm. taking a step back and looking at who is disproportionately impacted by these restrictions, by lack of access to quality, you know, reproductive and maternal mm -hmm. health care. Um, you know, it's it's black and indigenous women. And, yeah. and again, to me, you know, that is directly linked to this this ugly history of reproductive oppression. And I think when we talk about intersectionality, I think it's one point to talk about it in a way where we're sort of shedding a spotlight on the multiple oppressions that these communities are experiencing, but also looking at intersectionality as a way to come up with the right solutions mm -hmm. um, to address these challenges that communities are having. And so um, I think it's critically important that, that we unpack that, you know, and um, I think there's a broader conversation around health disparities and, and structural racism within the healthcare system that we have seen, I think, um, increase, you know, particularly coming out of the COVID-19 mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, and I think we need to keep the conversation going when it comes to the reproductive health pieces as well, particularly abortion care and, and maternal health care. So I wouldn't say that, you know, talking about you know, race and racism is my favorite intersectionality, <laughs> but I do think it's it's one of the most important pieces that we can unpack. Again, you know, especially if we're linking these challenges to broader economic implications for women and how important women are to our economy, mm -hmm. um, you know, and productivity in this country, you know, their health care is so essential to their ability to be productive. And so we mm -hmm. have to keep it in the center of the conversation. You've explained all of this so beautifully and um, in such, you know, I think it's so hard sometimes to talk about intersectionality in a way that calls in and calls out. And I think as you've threaded the needle so well. And Thank you. one reason why I joined CAP was actually, you have two products. Um, that I read when I was interviewing and got the position that made me feel like the communities I come from and serve are reflected in these products. And that made me want to come to CAP. And one of them is eliminating, um, eliminating racial disparities and maternal and infant mortality. Mm -hmm. And it's this product that I cite all the time in my work because it is such a thorough examination, both on the statistical and the policy end, but also in the historical end of how we are here mm -hmm. in the black maternal health crisis. And one of both my favorite and most important thing in that product is how you discuss the legacy of granny midwives and the imperative need for black women led care and centers, models for, post, uh, for prenatal birth and postnatal care. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that really needs to be part of the mainstream discussion of what does meaningful healthcare look like for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I'd love for you to share how, how these black women led centers for care are effective policy solutions to the crisis at hand. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, first off, I think it's important to think about patients, particularly patients of color, um, and, and research is clear on this, that, you know, we tend to prefer, feel more comfortable with healthcare providers that look like us. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the first thing. Um, and so knowing that as, you know, just a foundational evidence piece to this conversation, um, to me, that is connected to why we see, you know, these black led models of care be, be so instrumental and effective when it comes to providing patient-centered care. Um, you know, organizations like Mama Toto Village and um, Common Sense Childbirth, you know, led by, um, you know, um, midwives and doulas mm -hmm. in the space, you know, black midwives and doulas um, have been so essential to this work. And these are evidence-based models of care these models that have been developed by black women and indigenous women, I want to mm -hmm. make sure to bring them into this conversation, 
these they are evidence based. They have they are saving the yes. lives of moms and babies on the ground. They have zero, you know, maternal mortality. Um, infant mortality. And so I think that's important to lift up and we don't hear enough about them in mainstream mm -hmm. media. And I appreciate you for bringing this into the conversation. And so I think there's more that we can be learning from community based organizations and these, you know, um, models that have been developed by women of color. Um, because they are centering patients and they're also from these communities, mm -hmm. right? And so they know, you know, there are certain cultural aspects that are important to the clients and the people, um, their neighbors, yeah. to be honest. Um, they're bringing that into these models of care. They're testing them through and through. To them, you know, when they when a community experiences a death of mom or a baby, they feel that as if it's their own. Mm -hmm. So that is the motivation behind um, really being smart and thinking through these models of care in ways that make sure that they are saving the lives of the people that look like them, people in their own communities. And so I think it's really important to bring that into the conversation. And then there have been some um, policy advancements to help support mm -hmm. these organizations. The Black Maternal Health yes. Omnibus, for example, is you know a comprehensive package of 13 bills that helps address various dimensions of the Black Maternal Health crisis. and you know, that legislation includes solutions that help support those who are um, working as community-based, you know, healthcare professionals and paraprofessionals, um, making sure that the institutions that are training and support them have the funding that they need. Um, you know, there are also broader conversations in the space about how to work with HBCUs and other mm -hmm. uh, minority yeah. serving organizations to make sure that those who want to be a part of the solutions um, to support and advance maternal health equ equity in this country have those supports and so physicians are a part of it they're part of the solution but so are doulas mm -hmm. and midwives um, and other you know paraprofessionals working in the in maternal and infant health and so it's important to bring them into the conversation as well absolutely and one thing you said that really resonated with me is the importance and really the the honor of serving the community you come from mm -hmm. and how that in and of itself is a form of care that is a part of effective policy making and as part of our um one year of row one year without row mm -hmm. uh marking of that event we had a storyteller series where we featured six medical professionals ranging from doulas to midwives to OBGYNs That's and states great. with abortion bans. Mm -hmm. I would love to know for you, what storyteller do you think the country should be focused on when we talk about the state of national healthcare equity? Yeah, wow. I think as much as we can, you know, center the the voices of, of patients, um, you know, and it could be women, um, you know, or, or, you know, folks from the trans community, you know, mm -hmm. really thinking about centering the voices of those that are most marginalized in society and, and centering their voices as storytellers, I think is key. Um, I think sometimes it can be tricky too, because mm -hmm. Those of us sort of working in this, you know, sort of like the DC bubble yeah. as policy influencers, um, you know, sometimes we can forget that those who have lived experience are also um, experts. Absolutely. Right? And so, as much as we can marry the work that we're doing around developing the big policy ideas with those stories that are really true to the essence of like the experience. What, what are these, is the impact of these policies on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think is really key. And to me, those are the best models in terms of like, you know, the story that we can tell and present, um, you know, to policymakers and decision makers, I think is really key. So to me, it always goes back to how do we center, you know, those that are, interacting with the healthcare mm -hmm. system, whether it's the traditional healthcare system or even in non-traditional spaces, so that they can talk about their experiences and what they need. And then that should inform the policy decisions that we're making. 
Absolutely. And because we're focused on um, ensuring that people that are closest to the pain or the issue have the opportunity to speak to power, I would love to talk about this thread that I've seen throughout your career. Again, I'm a fangirl, so <laughs> I, I know what you've done, where you've been. Um, but I think for me, a really powerful thread that has stood out to me in your career is that you consistently use this phrase, caring with dignity. Mm -hmm. And I have seen you use it in your products. Um, again, one that I loved was Five Connections Between Immigration Justice and um, Reproductive Justice, mm -hmm. where you discuss how immigrant parents have the right to care with dignity. And recently at a CAP event, you discussed how abortion access allows a parent to care with dignity for her other children. And at, right now at your current role at IWPR, you do, you and your team do incredible work around centering the worker mm -hmm. within this great development we're having and focus on caregiving. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering from your perspective, how can we understand and develop a framework for giving care with dignity, but for the worker who is so oftentimes hidden in the shadows, mm -hmm. sometimes undocumented, mm -hmm. really enduring so many obstacles in their day-to-day -day life, yet they're still providing care to another person. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, um, so IWPR just hosted a care conference about a week or so ago with um, American University, and um, the conference was, was solely focused on care, you know, how do we help advance the care economy, you know, both from the perspective of supporting workers, but also, you know, those that are benefiting from care and receiving care. And, you know, one of the things that, that has stood out to me in a lot of the conversations about care is that, you know, everyone will have either been a caregiver, yeah. received care, you know, um, or supported, you know, someone who um, needs care or, or is a care provider. And so I think that's so essential to these conversations. And um, the, the term dignity is so important in the context mm -hmm. of this, right? Because when we think of dignity, we think of, you know, honor and respect. And for me, um, in order for that care worker or the woman who needs an, an abortion, um, you know, or a person who is receiving care, um, for, for them to have dignity, they have to have all the tools they need to thrive, yeah. right? And so that's the connection for me when I talk about dignity in the context of these issues. And, um, you know, when it comes to care, the care workforce, I mean, the care workforce is um, disproportionately represented by women of color. Mm -hmm. um, I think they tend to be invisibilized in the conversations about the care economy and how we need to grow the economy and build it. A lot of the national focus has been on, for example, you know, women and moms who have had to leave the workforce because they lost, you know, access to childcare during the pandemic. Um, you know, and, and a lot of that conversation, to be honest, has been centered around white women. And so I think for IWPR, you know, doing our work through a racial and gender lens, you know, it's been important for us to, to lift up the voices of the care workers as well and, and the work, the research, the policy advocacy, um, you know, the work that we do. And so it's important to bring those, those voices out. I mean, I was sharing a story how my own mother who, you know, retired after serving in the, the federal government for 30 years, mm -hmm. um, you know, for a brief moment in her retirement, she worked as a childcare worker. And at the time I was actually working at CAP. And so, you know, I, I saw her one weekend and she had this shirt this t-shirt about the fight for 15. And I remember being in that moment and the conversation around the fight for 15 in terms of increasing, you know, the minimum wage. And she, she was like, do you know about this effort? You know, I'm fighting for 15. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, mom, I'm very much aware of that effort. You know, it's something that my organization um, at the time, you know, the Center for American Progress is working on, you know, or thinking about this issue in the broader context of, of policy efforts that, you know, we, we have going on. And so um, I just say that to say, again, older black woman, you know, in retirement, this is something that she decided to, to take on 
um, to help fill the gaps in her own income. Um, and who would have thought that, you know, her daughter, you know, working in D.C. Um, in, in policy um, would also be working on an issue that is directly impacting her, who is now a new member of, you know, this, this care sector. Um, and so all of these issues are interconnected. And again, going back to the point that we made earlier, that intersectionality piece as well. I'm so grateful that you brought up um, your mom's story and how, you know, it's a difficult position, I think, as a change maker to come from the community you serve and write oh, yeah. about it and do those policies. And I think it's something we don't talk about enough. Yeah. We can have a whole, whole separate session on... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the yeah. intergenerational Absolutely. dynamics when it comes to, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm also a first generation yeah. college graduate. And yeah. so there's so much responsibility that comes along with that. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think as you support your, your family, but also, you know, the pressure and the weight that, you know, you can have. Um, you know, and these are all new experiences, both for you and for your family. So there's a lot to unpack there. There's so much yeah. to unpack. No, not enough yes. time. <laughs> <laughs> what I love is, you know, when my mom first came to the United States, the first, she had to work immediately. Mm -hmm. The first job she did was as a nanny mm -hmm. um, in a gym. Yeah. You know, and that was like the hustle that I was yeah. born from. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at the fact that after, you know, 30 years, there are women like my mother everywhere, yeah. all the time, still hustling and under much more oppressive circumstances, which is why I think what you were saying around like centering the worker within this bigger framework yeah. of who we are in the United States and the need to put personal stories and our personal stories in so many ways out there is so essential because our mothers are still, you know, yeah. they're still hustling they are. in so many ways. Yeah. yeah. And you know, also too, like your mother is probably so proud. I know she's so proud of you, <laughs> you know, and like they, they have taken on that work and they've hustled so yeah. they can see us do what we're doing today. And so um, that that's also a part of the narrative too. You know, yeah. we, we are their success stories. Yeah, and I, I really wish that, you know, we could have a whole session about the weight that we carry from our family's legacy. Yeah. I always think about it as it is a powerful thing that I can stand on and it makes my, it, it gives me so much purpose and strength, but it is also something that you carry with you. Yeah. And when I see you know, so many people um, of all different ages and generations now coming out to fight for reproductive justice in post Dobbs America um, and really come forward, I think, in ways that they haven't in rural states, purple states, all the states. Everywhere, yeah. um, it's, it's so affirming and it's a beautiful thing to see, like mm -hmm. whether it is you know, someone on TikTok posting a video about their feelings and why this matters so much to them, mm -hmm. or if it's a f state officials coming out sharing their own stories of abortion access or their own stories of experiencing horrific discrimination in public hospitals. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering for you, do you have any advice for people that are change makers now in the process of becoming like an even bigger and badder change maker, whether it's like through the arts, the storytelling, mm -hmm. um, the ballot box? Do you have any advice? Yeah, you know, I think that one of the things that's been important for me is to find community, particularly with other women of color. And I think, you know, whatever space you're navigating, particularly when it comes to social justice yeah. issues, you know, that alone is, is such a, a weight to carry, um, the responsibility of, of, you know, wanting to make the world a better place, you know, particularly mm -hmm. for people who, um, you know, are most marginalized in this country. And so for me, I think the advice that I would have for folks is, you know, find community with people yeah. Um, that have commonalities with you, whether it's, you know, your background, you know, um, in terms of your, your faith background or, um, you know, the state that you're from or, or whatever those important connections are for you. I think it's really important. And not only does that provide a sense of comfort, 
um, you know, when things get tough, because they're going to just yeah. by the nature of the work that we do. Um, but also those are your thought partners mm -hmm. when you want to bounce ideas off of someone yeah. or um, you want to rally together and um, think about how you can get in some good trouble yeah. next. Um, so I think building community is really important. I mean, you know, for the folks that are watching this, um, you know, more than likely they're already there, they're already mm -hmm. change makers, but it can be hard to sort of figure out how you stay in the game and yeah. um, how to do that in a way that not only honors your work, but also honors you as a human and, and taking care of yourself. Again, caring with dignity, even for yourself. Yeah, I think. that's true. Do you think that change makers have, a res have certain kinds of responsibilities to others? I think so. Um, I think obviously, you know, everyone, most people come to, to the work like this because something, because of an experience, whether it's their own mm -hmm. or and someone else's experience that they've observed. Um, and so I do think that that's, it's important to sort of remember that as you're sort of doing the work. Um, you know, but again, I mean, being at the center of all of this, especially in an in organization like CAP that focuses on so many different policy issues, but they're all connected. Yeah. And so I think being clear or, or knowing within yourself that you're also connected to these issues that you're working on too, um, I think is also just really important to, to how you show up. So, um, so yeah. It's amazing. Well, I'd love to hear more about your experience and background. You know, I know we talked about it a little bit earlier, but talk more about, you know, sort of how you show up in the space and in your work, particularly, you know, with your background and, you know, what, what gets you up in the morning? I think for me, it always comes to the people in my life and the legacy that I carry. Mm -hmm. I come from a family that has been displaced many times, mm -hmm. um, and I'm the first generation that ever had the opportunity to grow up in some kind of stability with a roof over my head, three meals a day, wow. and I was always, whatever, whatever we were going through, mm -hmm. I knew that there was a home that I can come back to. Mm -hmm. And I think I was always raised with the understanding that this is special, mm -hmm. that there is a moral duty to be the best that I can be because so many people have given up so much mm -hmm. for my generation to have this moment. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's what took me to um, areas or places that so much of my family had experienced. Like I worked in refugee camps, mm -hmm. migrant camps, and later on I went into a lot of prisons and jails and mm -hmm. my first job out of law school, I was really honored to work out of Rikers Correctional Facility many days a week. Mm -hmm. And for me, I see my parents' story and what could have been my story in so many of the clients I represented and had the honor of working with as a public defender. Mm -hmm. And now as the director of the Women's Initiative, what has always motivated me is ensuring that so many different kinds of audiences understand the deeply personal nature of what's happening mm -hmm. and that this is also an old story mm -hmm. that this in post jobs america we are seeing the criminal legal system used as it is always intended to have been used just against a new group yeah. and a new audience mm -hmm. and we've talked so much about you know threading the needle having an intersectional approach who is centered mm -hmm. in all of this. And to me, it's, again, centering marginalized women and marginalized communities that have always been in this dire state mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. lack of access to basic health care. And for me, you know, the protections that existed previously for abortion access didn't really mean a lot to my clients mm -hmm. because as you were saying around you know, abortion and economic security, how are my clients gonna get a ticket for the subway? Right. They can't afford $3. How are they gonna go to a doctor's office? They're terrified, they're undocumented, and there's a national call against immigrants using you know, our nation's healthcare system yeah. by, the, mm -hmm. by the person that is the most in power. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's, under, it's trying to use like this opportunity and honor I have at, at the Women's Initiative 
to explain in the most accessible way that what you're feeling right now has been felt by so many other people long before this case came about mm -hmm. and that there's a path to move forward mm -hmm. that is more effective yeah. and meaningful than before to more people. Yeah. No, that's so true. I think the point that you make, you know, particularly on the abortion access piece, like, I mean, ab abortion access was already fraught before right. the Dobbs yeah. decision, you know, especially, you know, when it comes to, as you said, you know, marginalized communities, whether you're a young person, mm -hmm. immigrant, um, a woman living in rural areas, mm -hmm. um, you know, for people who may not identify as, as women, but they have the ability to get pregnant and, and need an abortion. Yeah. And so, you know, um, that has also been in some ways kind of challenging to message, especially yeah. in this, in our post-ops <laughs> plans, right? Like particularly as, as those working in the policy space and, and advocacy and, and how we message this and the, the call for alarm. Yes. Um, you know, but it was already hard to access before this decision for, for mm -hmm. those communities. And so I appreciate you bringing that into the conversation. And I don't think we talked about, you know, sort of communities that tend to be invisibilized in some of these conversations. I definitely think, you know, those that are part of the criminal justice system, um, you know, they, we don't talk about them enough in these conversations mm -hmm. when it comes to access to care, access to health care, you know, being centered in, you know, health care solutions and, you know, being um, supported with quality care and, and with dignity. And so um, that's definitely a missing piece that we need to bring in more to the conversation. And so I appreciate you for, for bringing that in, in here, too. Absolutely. And I think like what you're saying about bringing in you know, bringing in people, ensuring that we're centering as many people that are impacted that previously haven't been the center of the story. My hope is that this is effectuated through storytellers. Yeah. Um, and for me, it is it is one of the most effective policy tools that exist. I don't think anything has I changed agree. the mind of a judge yeah. or someone in mm -hmm. power more than my client's story or more than understanding the personal consequences mm -hmm and just frankly, personal oppression yeah. that someone has to experience because of these legal and political and policy technicalities. Mm -hmm. And that's why I really love working at CAP is that I think as change makers, we have the tools to be, to have that value add through storytelling mm -hmm. and in ensuring that again, everyone from a 16 year old on TikTok to some policy person in DC understands the impacts of what's happening. Yeah, it's true. I think another cool thing too about CAP is that, you know, bringing in those stories, that's a part of the strategic yes. thinking yeah. and conversations. Like you're developing the big policy mm -hmm. ideas, the bold ideas. Um, you're thinking about intersectionality, you know, working across teams, across issues, but then you're also like bringing in the storytelling piece. Like how do we, get this, you know, use this as a way to influence what we're trying to build in terms of these policy solutions. It is a key aspect of like that broader sort of yes. like feedback loop when it comes to, to Absolutely. strategy. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Taylor, <laughs> I have followed your career for a long time. Your products are one of the reasons I decided to take the offer to come to CAP. And it has just been my honor to talk about not just the state of maternal care, for marginalized communities and the most effective policy outcomes, but also to share our stories and particularly about our moms. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so grateful for your time. And I hope to follow in your footsteps here at CAP. Well, so thank, thank you. you so much, Sabrina, for having <laughs> me. And it was such a joy speaking with you and learning more about you, particularly <laughs> your background and the things that make you human, um, in addition to being a policy expert here in DC. And I must say that, you know, the Women's Initiative is in <laughs> great hands. And so that makes me feel all the more wonderful um, to get to know you and be here today.